Syphilis is one of the more serious sexually transmitted infections and can even be deadly if left unchecked. But even with all the information and knowledge we have about syphilis, cases are still on the rise. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about the potential harmful effects syphilis can have on the body, how it's spread from person to person, and if someone gets syphilis, what are the potential treatment options? We'll also talk about who should consider getting tested for syphilis. It's going to be an interesting one. So let's do this. Syphilis is caused by a bacterium called Treponema pallidum, which belongs to a group or phylum of bacteria known as spirochetes, which, as you can see, have this coiled or spiraled structure. This is most commonly spread during intercourse when someone comes in direct contact with an infectious lesion. And these infectious lesions are most commonly found on the skin of genital structures. And we'll get into more detail of these lesions in just a second. But I do want to mention that it can also be spread during pregnancy, which could cause infection of the fetus. And this is one of the reasons why it's recommended that women who are pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant get tested for syphilis. And on top of that, there are cases where people can be asymptomatic, so someone who's thinking of getting pregnant or is pregnant may not even know that they have the infection. So of course we'll talk more about who else should consider getting tested for syphilis. But first let's go back to that infectious lesion. Within three to 90 days of initial infection, a person will develop a small bump or papule, again, most commonly on the genital structures like the penis or the vulva. Now that papule will soon open up or ulcerate, and this is the infectious lesion, which is actually called a chancre. Pretty interesting name. Now this chancre is highly infectious, meaning you could spread it easily to another person because it contains a high number of these treponemes or the bacteria. So in other words, probably not a good idea to participate in intercourse with people who have chancres. So this stage or phase of syphilis with the presence of the chancre is actually called primary syphilis. And this is again when it's typically spread from person to person. Now you might be thinking, how in the world could someone spread during this stage? Couldn't you just look down in the nether region and see, hmm, I've got a chancre. Probably shouldn't have intercourse and should seek medical attention. Well, there are some characteristics that we need to consider that increase the likelihood of spread during this stage. One, the chancre is actually painless. So because of this, many people won't seek medical attention and they may just not know what it is. Two, the chancre will spontaneously heal within three to six weeks, all on its own without any treatment. And three, yes, these are visible lesions, but depending exactly where they are on the genital structures, they might not still be in plain view and they can vary in size. And lastly, yes, even though they're typically found on like the penis and the vulva, they can be found and spread to other regions or places in the body, like the mouth, the throat, inside the vaginal canal, and even the anus. And you can definitely see from some of those locations that it would be hard to see these lesions. And if we're wondering how it could get to those places, it just depends on the brand or type of intercourse that you participate in. Within weeks after the chancre develops, about 25% of people with untreated infection will develop secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis is when the illness becomes more systemic. In other words, it'll spread to various regions throughout the body, and this comes with a variety of signs and symptoms. You can get generalized symptoms like fever, sore throat, headache, malaise, myalgias, which are muscle aches, even swollen lymph nodes, and some people will get little patches of hair loss. And of course, the classic or the characteristic finding of secondary syphilis, the rash. Now the rash can take many forms, but classically it's a diffuse symmetric maculopapular rash that affects the entire torso, the extremities, and does include the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Now, what's interesting is that like primary syphilis, secondary syphilis will resolve on its own typically with most people without any treatment and then people will enter this latent phase of the disease or latent syphilis, which is when people just don't have any symptoms or are asymptomatic. Latent syphilis can last for many years and even indefinitely, but if people continue to remain untreated, those people who are untreated, 25 to 40% of them can develop what's called tertiary syphilis. And tertiary syphilis is when things get even more serious and can even lead to death. But a couple of things to consider. One is that tertiary syphilis can occur anywhere from one up to 30 years after the initial infection. So quite a broad range there. And two, 
There are cases where people have developed these symptoms of tertiary syphilis that we're going to talk about without ever experiencing symptoms of primary and secondary syphilis. But during tertiary syphilis, cardiovascular structures can be affected, like the heart and blood vessels. In particular, the biggest artery in the human body, the aorta, can be damaged, as well as even the aortic valve, and that can cause the valve to be leaky and eventually lead to left-sided heart failure. People can also develop these growths called gumas on the skin, bones, and internal organs. These actually aren't that common, but they're likely what you've seen in the movies when they try to portray people with syphilis, and they're these soft, tumor-like growths that appear to have this deforming effect on the skin. Tertiary syphilis can also affect the brain and other nervous system structures, which can cause people to have a progressive loss of judgment, memory, which can lead to dementia and even psychosis. People also experience a loss of coordination and even these sharp stabbing pains that can affect the limbs, the back, the face, and these pains can last for minutes and even days. Now, I do wanna mention that there are some other neurological symptoms that can happen earlier in syphilis, like during primary and secondary syphilis, that can affect the eyes and the ears, but those symptoms combined with the neurological symptoms that I just mentioned during tertiary syphilis kind of fall under this umbrella of neurosyphilis, which we can do a follow-up video on later on, because I'm sure by now we've got the point, syphilis can be quite horrific. So we should probably answer some other questions. Can we cure syphilis, and if so, how? And also, should you get tested? Thankfully, there is a treatment and cure for syphilis, and it's with an antibiotic, a certain type of penicillin called penicillin G. Now, this penicillin G will be delivered through some sort of injection, like IM intramuscularly or IV intravenously. And I'll put the exact treatment protocol in the description below, but in general, we could separate the treatments into two main categories, whether the person has neurological symptoms or doesn't. So if they don't have neurological symptoms, regardless if it's primary, secondary, tertiary, or latent, well, latent, they wouldn't have any symptoms, but if they don't have neurological symptoms, you can treat them with the IM injection. And that'll either be one injection all the way up to three injections total. But if they have any neurological symptoms, whether those occur during primary, secondary, or tertiary, again, this umbrella of neurosyphilis that I hinted to earlier, in that case, they will get the medication delivered intravenously, pretty much every four hours for 14 days straight. Now, why is that? Well, if the treponemes or the bacteria that cause syphilis get into the nervous tissue and even the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, the IM injections are just not enough to penetrate those tissues. So you have to increase the frequency as well as the dosing. And as a quick FYI, if someone's allergic to penicillin, there are some other antibiotics that you could use. Maybe you've heard of an antibiotic called doxycycline or another called ceftriaxone. So there are options for people who have allergies to penicillin. But I do wanna go back to when I mentioned a cure for syphilis. What do we mean by that? Well, first and foremost, we're talking about eradicating the treponemes or the bacteria that cause syphilis. But does that mean you won't have any long-term consequences for getting syphilis? Well, in general, the earlier you catch it, the better. Most people who catch it during primary and secondary syphilis and get antibiotic treatment will have a full recovery. Even the gummas, that, those skin growths that develop during tertiary syphilis, those actually heal pretty well after antibiotic treatment. But if we're getting to the point where we have damage to the heart, we mentioned the aortic valve and the aorta earlier, or damage to the nervous system, or damage to any of the other organs, you can get to this point where that damage cannot be reversible. Yes, we can kill the pathogens and eradicate them from causing more damage, but there are certain points where we're not gonna be able to reverse damage to the heart, nervous system structures, and other organs, which leads us to this idea of why early detection is so important. So this is where we need to talk about testing. Of course, if someone has signs and symptoms consistent with syphilis, they should be tested. Maybe they notice the chancre or the rash that occurs during secondary syphilis, especially the rash that includes the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. But what happens if people don't have those signs or symptoms? What are the recommendations then? Well, there are certain patient populations or populations of people that are recommended to get tested regardless of having any of the signs and symptoms. We already mentioned pregnant women or women that are planning on getting pregnant should be tested. Patients that have HIV, it's also recommended that they undergo syphilis testing as they are potentially immunocompromised. Men who have intercourse with men. And one of the reasons for this we kind of alluded to earlier, you can kind of think of it from the perspective of the type of intercourse that tends to occur more frequently in this relationship would lend itself to developing chancres in the anus or the rectum, and those could potentially go unnoticed. People who have high-risk sexual behavior should also be tested. Multiple partners, especially unknown partners, without protection, 
should undergo syphilis testing as, frankly, other sexually transmitted disease testing. Now, that does not mean, if you don't fall into one of these categories, that you can't get tested for syphilis. Most primary care providers, Instacares, Urgent Cares, will provide syphilis and other sexually transmitted disease testing if you have concerns or want to be screened for these. There are also multiple online companies that are even more anonymous that you could pay out of pocket for, and then they can actually direct you to a lab that's close to your home. So hopefully that helped you learn some useful information about syphilis. And if you like to continue to learn, especially about science, then you're likely gonna love the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is an amazing interactive online learning platform for STEM subjects. It's one of the best ways to learn math, science, and computer science. And for those of you that are new to the channel, we've been working with Brilliant for years because we truly believe in what they do for people's education. I still personally use Brilliant. So no matter where you are in your educational journey, if you're in junior high, high school, college, or just wanna be a lifelong learner, Brilliant will definitely have lessons that are applicable to you. And as a bonus, they're constantly adding new lessons each and every month. My favorite lessons are still the ones on scientific thinking because I love improving logic, critical thinking skills, and learning how to apply knowledge to real world situations. So if you're interested in becoming a little bit more brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash IHA to start a free 30-day trial, plus the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. We'll also include that link in the description below. And I do wanna say thank you for everyone for supporting our channel. If you wanna to continue to support the channel, please like and subscribe if you feel the need. Leave some comments in the comment section. Let us know what you thought of the video and any future ideas that you may have. And of course, we'll see you next time.